Welcome to my world. Two escargot, pate, frise, two green salads. Okay, man, it's not here. Lamb chop, steak street. Shouldn't you be doing something? Two faux filet and a pepper steak. Come on, make the dessert. Chocolate tart, please. As a cook, tastes and smells are my memories. And now I'm in search of new ones. So I'm leaving New York City and hope to have a few epiphanies around the world. And I'm willing to go to some lengths to do that. I am looking for extremes of emotion and experience. I'll try anything. I'll risk everything. I have nothing to lose. I picked Cambodia as a place to go because I knew nothing about it, and because it was the last place on Earth that I guess I really wanted to go. Maybe you've seen the killing fields. This is just about all I knew of Cambodia. And I guess the first thing that struck me was, gee, it looks just like the movie. Familiar, frightening, and a little intimidating. At first, it's a little depressing, and you really wonder what people see in it. But the country grows on you. The people are lovely, and the food is eye-opening and mind-expanding. Using aromatic herbs and spices, traditional Cambodian cuisine is both complex and accessible. Fat and meats are used sparingly, while vegetables, fruits, and fish are used liberally. We're in beautiful downtown Phnom Penh, Cambodia. This is where uh, madmen, uh, missionaries, uh, relief workers, journalists, and backpackers and Westerners come to behave badly. We're gonna buy some uh, crunchy, uh, tasty uh, breakfast, maybe a little fruit pick up a little picnic lunch and then uh, go discharge some heavy weaponry. First, a haircut. Last night, I was at the appropriately named Heart of Darkness bar, and I was told by a local expatriate who'd been here for some time the four rules of survival in Cambodia. One, always wear a condom. Two, don't drink the water. Three, throw out your anti-malaria pills. Four, for God's sake, stay away from the durian fruit. Stay away from it. That's all I needed to hear. Big Chanko's back, and he's got a kicky new summer dude. I'm ready. I can appear in public in Cambodia. Let's eat. Let's go eat some crunchy uh, bugs and little birdies and have some fruit, maybe kill something. All right, I'm on the hunt for the king of all Asian fruits, the elusive, terrifying, melon-like durian. A man you can get easily distracted in the market. Yeah, I need, like, identification of this product before I put it in my mouth this early in the morning, I think. And even identification might not do it for me, actually. The colors are beautiful. All right, maybe for lunch. Maybe we'll pick it up for a picnic. The food in this place is really challenging my intestinal fortitude. My culinary bravado is starting to shrivel. And there's stuff here that's, you know, just, you know, alarmingly bright, sort of unnatural colors and jelly-like. That I think I'm going to uh, lay off of. That looks radioactive. I try not to eat food that, that, that exhibits color that does not exist in nature. Uh, and then, of course, there's some stuff I know what it is, but I don't think I'll be having any, like uh, the, the chicken skin and giblets. I see something I'm curious uh, about, though, that I might call for breakfast. All right, here we go, crickets. Well, let me get one. Let's get five. Head first or tail first? Anyway. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Could use a beer with them. Kind of a cross between, like, french fries and beef jerky. All right, enough distractions. Back to the mission at hand. I want durian, must have durian, need durian, have to get some durian. Where's the durian? I should be able to smell it. I know it's around here somewhere. Oh yeah, baby, the terrifying durian. Do they, do they have to sell you a whole one, I'm guessing? We'll buy a knife and uh, we'll, uh, we'll buy some stuff and then we'll tear into this uh, someplace. Uh, if you could pick me out a nice one, then you can just wrap it to go. I saw kitchen equipment over there. We're going to try to get us a nice some meat axe to cut the durian with. I gather from my uh, limited reading on this uh, subject that one does not want to be in a close, confined area with a lot of people around when you hack into this thing. This dirty diaper-smelling fruit can weigh up to 12 pounds. Now that's a load. OK, we got our cutlery. We assembled a little picnic for ourselves, including a single durian in this double-wrapped bag here. 
trained elephants upon smelling durian will might charge and choose to stomp on me. This is this costs ten dollars U.S. Eight eight dollars U.S., which is a lot for a piece of fruit anywhere in the world. So people really like this. I mean, this is a this is hugely popular all over Asia. But you know, it's a love hate thing because uh, it stinks to high heaven, but apparently it's you know absolutely wonderful and addictive. And I mean, I've heard about it. You know, in the states, you know, people talking about it. You know, as an experience that. Uh, you know, they keep coming back to. It's a message board online. People are like, how do I score durian in the United States? How do I get durian to the United States? So this is it. The inside of the durian has five compartments containing the edible custardy pulp. This looks like a lobe of foie gras, doesn't it? Scary looking, huh? It's almost smoky. It's actually really good. This is really good. It stinks to high heaven. It doesn't taste like it smells. It's actually subtle, kind of fruity, but the smell is very much part of the experience. Rich as all hell. I mean, you need, like, bring your friends to this experience. If you have any friends left after you've transported it, they're not going to love you for that. Now, as I understand it, one buys one of these little swallows, cups it in one's hands, and then releases it uh, with a wish. And uh, presumably, uh, in return for your, your kindness and act of, uh, of, of mercy, you will be granted this wish. Here we go. I'm making a wish. I hope that the smell of durian leaves me soon. I've been told about a rather, how shall I say, unique eating experience about 15 kilometers out of town. I'm a little apprehensive. It's on a military base. Okay, I guess I didn't need to call ahead for reservations. What do you recommend? Yeah, I think we're going to try the uh, K-57. Let's do two magazines to start. So, I'm kind of hungry. I'm thinking, you know, maybe we'll play a little with a, a ham gun, and then, uh, then we'll snack. This is no ordinary eater. Sure, you can order drinks and snacks, but the specialty of the house is firearms and artillery. Nothing like a cold anchor and the smell of cordite in the morning. I don't have a lot of breakfast like this in New York. Maybe I should. Sure, our audiences have noticed the similarity between me and a young Sean Connery. That's what we're shooting out. Chosen gun of James Bond and Walter BPK. A lot of things in my life that I've done that have felt really, really good have had at least an element of shame involved. Thanks. Okay, that'll do me. You know, even if you're talking about a really good, really big, really rich meal, you feel a little bit of shame to yourself afterwards. Why is it that shame and pleasure are such close partners? So as I leave the shooting range, I'm feeling a little bit ashamed. Although I did have a rollicking good time. But I still reek of that durian. I've been traveling around Asia, eating alone, strangers gawking at me and chattering in strange languages, eating every variety of strange food. It's lonely. So I'm very grateful and very happy that my friend and boss, Philippe, the owner of Leal, my restaurant in New York, decided to join me in Cambodia. I hear there's some organ meat in the market that Philippe would go crazy for. The French love organ meat. We should point out that this market's like 130 degrees. I have to walk in a crouching position. There's, you know, under a tent, which, you know, ensures that all that nice heat and sort of uh, the gas from the decomposing uh, carcasses all around is rising up around you. This is all appetizing. So, uh, and we're in for a treat. Now, it's always good to rely on a Frenchman. Philippe's an adventurer and a colonialist in the best sense of the word. I love Philippe, and I love food, and it's really fun to travel with him. But, you know, as with all things French, it's a love-hate thing, too. Philippe tends to get me in trouble. He wants to eat everything. But there is a fish here that has been uh, basically cut out opened open. up, butter, butterfly, the, the, the major part of the rib removed, and the rest, like I guess, hung and smoked. Well, it's appetizing. Going to the insect district. That's a bit all, or that's a little bird? That's a little bird. We want a, you want a small one? Yeah, let's, let's have some crunchy little birds. Fried chicken Cambodian style. So eat everything, right? Roll it in a little, a little of the 
the stuff, <laughs> salt and pepper and, um, Enjoy. and lime. Do it everything, huh? Oh, good. It's delicious. I'm so happy. This is so good. Pick a bag of those to a next game. See here, look. This is what I was talking about. My last LSD trip looked just like this, by the way. From what I can tell, this gelatinous substance is a real favorite for breakfast. Oh, man, I'm gonna have to taste this. But I think I'm gonna let Philippe go first. This one here, little bit. Not much. Um, it's a bit, uh, you know, very jello-like, very bland. It's almost like a negative taste, you know, it's mm -hmm. less than taste. Okay, that, that sounds right up my alley. Yeah. I know a lot. It tastes like tea. It tastes like jelly green tea. Let's blow up. Excellent. We're well, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, we're headed to the uh, the tripe section. Uh, Philippe saw some really nasty bits of pig guts that, uh, well, you know, he's French. Oh, Need I you. say more? I'll take this as a compliment. <laughs> So this is mixed swipe, I guess, right? Okay, like this? Yes? Big buckets of steaming, nasty-looking tripe. I make tripe very well in the classic French manner, but I don't particularly like it. I think it smells like wet dog. So this particular tripe, I don't even know what animal it's from, and it's in a big, nasty-smelling heap with tongues mixed in there somewhere. Well, this is caviar to Philippe. He's got to have this. Lemon grass pipe. Oh, yes. See? I'm convinced that he's poisoning me at this moment. I'm wondering why he hates me, why he's doing this to me. But you know the French, they're a mystery. Remember, they like Jerry Lewis over there, too. I'm thinking, run away, run away. And Philippe is like, eat more tripe, eat more bugs. That, let's try that. I'm like, get me back to the hotel. I want a grilled cheese sandwich. I finally dragged Philippe away from the claustrophobia of the market and the organ beats. I'm in need of some open space. Having digested the culinary delights of the market, I'm ready to find the floating village on Lake Tonle Sap that I'd heard about. What are the fast about going out to a uh, floating village? As I understand it, it's a fishing village. Uh, it's a reasonably self-contained community. As far as what to expect, uh, once again, we'll know until we get there. But it's apparently an entire floating community. I mean by that that their houses float, their livestock pens float. They operate floating fish farms, floating restaurants, floating businesses. Their entire lives, their entire communities are waterborne and move from place to place as situation requires. Philippe once again decides that he's going to risk life and limb, my life and limb, for emotional reasons and for an adventure. He's not content to eat in a restaurant. He wants to eat local food. And he sees a woman cooking food for her family. You know, it's all rice with uh, whatever she's preparing, you know, it's all uh, fish concoction or and says, oh, let's eat what she's eating. I think she's very surprised to have us come along. And we're very aware of the fact that she very likely has little food. So all we want is a little taste yes, okay, to see what she's pleasure. doing. So uh, what is it then? Pork, fish, garlic, and fish pants. I say <laughs> Philippe. <laughs> Outstanding. We chose the right place, uh, Philippe. I think yes. they're selling ballpark francs over there at the other place. <laughs> And all she's doing is stir-frying a mixture of pork and fish, served with rice and a little green onion. It smells so good. Sugar? Some sugar. Some sort of sugar syrup. Right, like a pure uh, sugar cane uh, syrup. Pay attention, though, to how hot that wok is, how controlled the heat is, how well she manipulates the flame and the pot and the wood to apply heat to cook this very simple but very nutritious meal. This woman is very kind and very generous, and I think curious and maybe a little awed at the strange freakazoids who want to have a little taste of her food. Oh, look at this. <laughs> My God, thank you so much. I, I couldn't. Look at this. You first, you sniff this meal out. Oh. Ah, a little pepper. Chili. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me roast it a little first. Huh? <laughs> Yes, like this. 
Yes? Okay. Mmm, smells delicious. Mmm. Mmm. I'll be back here. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it is good. Yes. It's simple, it's honest, and it tastes good. Freshwater gun. It's the people that make the difference. And if you're going to travel, it's always wonderful to eat what the people are eating at your destination. This is the way they feed themselves. This is the way they live. This is what they're eating. This is not hotel food. I am aware, however, as I'm eating it, she's washing the pot in the river water. But I should probably visit my gastroenterologist when I return to New York. You know, I'm reconsidering traveling with this guy. That does me. Very good, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Here comes dessert. Yeah, it's it like bananas flambe. I mean, it's basically... So it's all dessert? It looks sweet to me. There's a little floating dessert boat that pops up alongside. I guess they see us from a little down river and come sailing up with some caramelized bananas and fresh fruit and sweets. So it's only fruits, that right? Good. It smells so good. That, that is a mango. Pickled mango. Pickled mango. Okay. So we start with this here? Yeah. Mmm, that's great. Spectacular. This is good. So if you're really curious about a country, eat how everyday people eat. And this is how everyday people eat in this village. Sometimes you find satisfying meals in the strangest places. It was good. I just violated absolutely every Lonely Planet traveler's guide there is and loved it. Let's see, unripened fruit, people coliform bacteria. And that's why I love Philippe and why I hate Philippe. He's so happy. Oh, sole mio. He inspires both the best and the worst in me. So this was something I'm glad I didn't miss. Hookworm and liver fluke, add that to the... Lonely planet violations today. Philippe and I have traveled from Phnom Penh to Siem Reap to explore the last vestiges of a once mighty empire and to discover high end Khmer cuisine. And Wat. Looking good. Don't see a lot. Don't see this in uh, Jersey. Truly one of the most imposing sites of the ancient world, a city of temples in the middle of the jungle. You, you can't even take pictures of this. It's too big. It's just too beautiful. It's too intricate. It's endless. He has a nice view here. On one of the seven wonders of the world. It's the child's dream of adventure. There you are, standing next to evidence of a magnificent and intricate ancient civilization. You're dwarfed by the scale and the volume of it all. This was the pinnacle of the Khmer Empire. And I'm ready for a meal that matches the grandeur of this experience, or at least comes close. Home to the famed Angkor Wat temples, the city of Siem Reap has a world-class hotel that caters to foreign tourists. This is Philippe's last night in Asia. He's got to get back to Laos. So as an appropriate send-off, we decide to have in the hotel a royal Cambodian meal. After a morning spent eating tripes and tongues and bugs and a rather run down and, you know, not so tidy Dom Pen, and an afternoon spent firing automatic weapons outside of town, decided that, that we deserve to live like colonial imperialist pig dogs. So we tuck into some really excellent, very well prepared, very subtle, very precise, colorful food that really, for the first time, gives us a sense of the possibilities inherent in traditional Khmer cuisine. We have a first course here. Beef, crushed peanuts, black mushrooms, and minced sweet basil in a fresh rice paper wrapping. Again, really fresh. Sure, it's an egg roll, but it's a damn good one. Pumpkin and lemongrass soup with a dollop of coconut milk. Yes. Lovely, thank you. Pumpkin, cool. And a nice touch, a cumin stirring stick that infuses flavor. Delicious. Beef sautéed with garlic, red peppers, and soy sauce. Served in a banana leaf. This one is your beef 
and garnished with deep fried threads of ginger, turmeric, potato, and taro. That's extraordinary. Yeah. Yes. One steam fish and one steam rice, table 52, please. Whole grouper, steamed with shiitake mushrooms. Topped with red pepper, cilantro, scallions, and fresh ginger. And finished with hot oil and a chili sauce. Mmm. A really good meal, beautifully presented. A truly inventive use of local ingredients creating rich and textured dishes. Really well. well. This is the greatest idea. I'll miss Philippe, but I'm recharged and ready to move on for more food adventures.